Hi. Hello. Thanks for joining me tonight. No problem. I'm very excited to be here. So Olivia, why don't you give us a nice introduction about your journey for your yeah. professional training and so forth? Yeah, yeah. So for those of you who don't know, um, I'm Olivia. I just turned 20 and I grew up in LA. Um, I started dance when I was nine. So I started late compared to a lot of people. So I had to play a lot of catch up. I had to do a lot of extra work. Um, I got serious about ballet. I would say when I was 12 or 13 is when I started taking classes consistently. Um, I then got into Colburn Dance Academy, which is in downtown Los Angeles, which is a really great program. Really helped me a lot on my technique, also just dis like discipline for ballet and just kind of learning how to navigate the ballet world crossed with like just having a normal schedule and trying yeah. to incorporate school and healthy patterns and all of that good stuff. And when I was getting into ballet, I'd been going to Pacific Northwest Ballet summer intensives for a few years. I think I went five years in total. And in summer of 2020, they asked me to join their professional division, which is like the year round come and train in Seattle with us. So that's where I am right now. I'm in my second year, which it's a two year program. So unfortunately this is my last year, but you know, it's been really great. We're working really hard right now. Swan Lake opens in a week and a half, yeah. which is crazy. We're all super <laughs> excited. So super busy, working hard, but that's a little bit about me. Awesome. So uh, Swan Lake starts in a week and a half. Oh my gosh. So. Yeah performances are in person, I assume. They are. Amazing. It is great. So you started dancing at nine years old, which yeah. as you mentioned, definitely later than usual. Uh, what kind of got you into the studio at that age? I actually, it. I had no interest in dance, which mm. is funny because, you know, my mom put my sister in dance to see if that was something that she would want to pursue. And it wasn't, which is completely fine. That's not for everybody. And I didn't have a place to go one day. Like my sister was at summer school and the person who happened to be at summer school who could watch me for the day was now one of my lifelong teachers. Her name is Romy Cars. She was in the core de ballet at New York City Ballet for a little while. So she took me to her open ballet class and I just happened to be like, wow, I really love this. This is fun. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. so it wasn't even me being interested in taking a class. It was kind of just something that happened. And then I was like, this is for me. <laughs> That's really interesting. You don't often hear about dancers starting around the age of nine. It's like always yeah. like either three or, or you have yeah. dancers or you have the dancers that start at like 16. Yeah. So you starting at nine, you explained you had to do a lot of catch up. Right. How was that? What did that involve? It, you know, it really required a lot of not all, not just physical time in the studio, like taking extra classes or really asking teachers, you know, what can I work on? What can I do to get there? Or can you help me with that? But it also was a lot of like mental decisions of like, mm -hmm. this is going to be a lot harder for me. It's going to take extra time. I'm going to have to make sacrifices. You know, I may not be able to go out on this day because in the long term, this is more important. It was really like the mental discipline that really I had to learn because I was trying to catch up. So yeah. in a way it was good because now I really understand that a big part of dance and ballet is the mental discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's so many different aspects. So first of all, you doing that at nine years old, nine is still very young oh, yeah. to, take, to take on the, um, the responsibility of needing to essentially catch up in, in a, in a art that we know to be extremely demanding both yes. physically and mentally. So I give you a lot of credit for <laughs> taking that on as a nine year old. Um, how was your support system throughout that, you know, at home and, yeah. I was very, very lucky to be extremely supported at home. Also, I, I was very lucky to be, I'd say from a place such as LA, 
because mm -hmm. there's a lot of environment there for, you know, dance or arts or opportunities. I definitely was lucky to have people in my close circle who had danced at places like New York City Ballet or Pacific right. Northwest Ballet, because I think that helped me realize that it could be a very like serious career path. Yeah. Like it was something that could be a job. Yeah. And, you know, I just think I was very lucky in that my teachers also, uh, they did push me, but they were, it was in my best interest. They had my best interests at heart. And there's always like a teacher that you don't like, or that's really hard on you or whatever, but there's always the ones that actually really do care, which are the ones that you need to like come back to and check in with, which are the ones that are really the grounded support system. So I was lucky to find that when I first started. Yeah, and that's the thing, support systems. It's plays such a huge role, and I don't think it gets enough airtime in the sense of um, a dancer realizing that having support and positive reinforcement both at home and or at the studio really can help with um, propelling a dancer forward right in regards Most to definitely. building self-confidence and yeah. abilities in the studio i yeah no i definitely agree in the studio especially like even if it's peers or just someone that you know you can trust that will be there to either, you know, if you need advice or, you know, you're just genuinely asking a question like, does this look good? What can I do to make this better? Whoever it is at the studio, sometimes it's like the teacher that no one likes and you, for some reason, you have a connection with them. You know, it's really just, there is someone there who cares about what you do and how you're gonna get there. It's just, sometimes you gotta make that connection it's not always super obvious, but they're there. <laughs> yeah, that's a really great point. And I think this is really important for both educators and dancers to hear. I've spoken to many dancers. I've been doing these conversations for, for over two years already. Yeah. And I've spoken with dancers who have had to take major breaks from the dance world. And mm -hmm. so often, not always, but so often, a lot of um, those that need those breaks are coming from places where they perhaps didn't have as much positive yeah. support along their journey. I experienced this personally, like myself, mm -hmm. um, where I had major support, but I did also experience an environment that, that where I didn't really get that. And it's really what led me to my own burnout. It was part one of the reasons. Yeah. Um, but essentially, you know, for, especially for educators who are going to be listening to this chat, I just want them to know that, you know, being there to support your dancers plays such a huge role in their success. Oh yes, most definitely. Most mm -hmm. definitely. And even when it's an environment that, you know, I, I get a lot of people at different studios saying, you know, I, I don't have many friends here. Mm -hmm. Like I can't rely on, you know, peer support. So sometimes it's really difficult. And sometimes in that situation, your best ally is yourself. And as much as it is good to get that support from others, it's really, it comes back to the mental discipline. It's like, you know, if you can feel good enough about yourself and have faith and confidence that what you're doing is going to get you where you need to go, you'll find those people along the way who are supposed to be with you on the journey. And it may not be immediate. Like, I think we've all had those places where we're like, this environment is not good for me. Like, I do not feel good here i think every dancer has that situation at some point but you know it's a long journey it does not happen overnight so mm -hmm. olivia i think you reflect a lot of uh confidence and and radiance in yourself um and i'd love to hear from you how you are able to sustain that. I think a lot of dancers can benefit from maybe hearing that, maybe hearing how you are able to, within such a competitive environment, stay both grounded, but also continue in your motivation, continue in your drive. And then I'm gonna have a two part to this question. <laughs> the second part is how you maintain balance, because I know you mentioned that it takes a lot of mental, um, determination and mental discipline but i also want to talk about where balance comes into that yeah so definitely for the confidence aspect i used to be very much not that way mm -hmm. um 
especially I think it was because I started late and I felt like I hadn't earned the right yet to be oh. confident in class because you know I was the new person you know I wasn't on everyone else's level but I think when I realized that the only way to get myself to that next level and to really like start growing as a dancer was to start to be confident you know and that's a really scary thing to do because at first it doesn't feel right it doesn't look right and but that's why you need to do it to figure out how to make it make it work for you i was the very quiet person in class very shy never went in the first group never went in the front but like when i look at myself today i you know i always try to stand in the front and i enjoy going first like it's like you said it's a balance to where, you know, maybe some days that doesn't feel right for you. And that is fine. I have days where I'm like, I don't need to do that today. <laughs> that doesn't feel right for me. And there are some days where I'm like, you know what, I need to be a little bit more assertive today. And it is scary. It's scary because it gives the opportunity for people to judge you. And when you realize that you'll be fine, <laughs> nothing's gonna happen to you when you put yourself out there, the worst thing that can happen is maybe someone says something about you but as long as you know yourself and you have that grounded sense of who you are you know it really doesn't matter you know you're doing what's best for you and that's the most important yeah yeah a couple things that i'm hearing here that i want to pick apart because i think they're really important that you're doing the first thing is it sounds like you had to really challenge yourself in regard to experiencing that level of confidence, right? That it's not necessarily something that just came intuitive. It didn't just no. come <laughs> naturally, which is so common for everybody, most dancers, including myself. Um, but it sounds like you were able to kind of push forward and say like this, almost put your blinders on. This is what I'm working on. People can say things about me. I can't control what they're gonna say about things about me. And that's okay. And, yeah. and you're making, you're like, it's like you're making space for that to happen, which allows you to become okay with the fact that that might happen and not let it limit you. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> most definitely. And I think when I started going to summer intensives and seeing how many different dancers there are out there, just how different everybody is as a dancer, made me realize that like my version of confidence that looks different from somebody else's might be exactly what I need to look like. Like, I don't need to look like that girl who gets, I don't know, like 20 corrections every class because she's so overly confident. Maybe I just need to find a healthy in between there. Mm -hmm. And like you said, making space for the opportunity of putting yourself out there still being focused on yourself and what you need to do, but just observing. I think observing is a really, really important thing in dance as well, because we get so sucked into like what we're doing, the mirror, what we see in the mirror, what the teachers are saying to us, but it's important to also observe around you. And I think that's also what helped me when I see my peers be confident and see other people reflect positively to that. I'm like, you know what, this is, something that I can do too, like that I can yeah. feel confident in that. Yeah. And it's almost like utilizing your peers in a way that's motivating you and not necessarily allowing competition to limit yeah. you. That's a, That's a huge factor here as well. But also you're making space for days that might not feel as good, which I think is right. really important. A lot of dancers enter that all or nothing mindset where it's like yep. either everything has to be perfect or it's yep. a disaster. Yep. And what you're, you're, proving to us is that not every day is going to be perfect and that's okay. That's what dancers need to hear, <laughs> that that is okay. It, it most definitely is okay. Like I have class from 8.30 right now to 6 p.m. So mm -hmm. in all of those rehearsals and classes that I go through in the day, one of them might be fantastic and then I might be tired for the next one and it might not go as well. And that is fine. Like, yeah. I can't be 800% all the time perfect because perfection isn't real in dance. That's why we have the careers that we do because 
there's so you can constantly build on everything technique artistry just exploring new expressions and who you are and sometimes who you are is just not having a good day and <laughs> that happens all the time like when you wake up early in the morning and don't want to go take technique class and look at yourself in the mirror don't <laughs> it's not yeah. a requirement yeah absolutely it also sounds like a part of you is like we can't necessarily take ourselves too seriously well my big thing is that i leave ballet at the studio like mm -hmm. once i come home maybe i'll go over the choreography to make sure i remember it for the next day but that will be it once i'm home i'm not in my living room doing plies or tendus or trying to do any specific thing that relates to what's going to happen there it's really important for me at least to separate my two lives because then it makes me feel like I have something different to do in my day. You know, I can go out and I can take a walk and I can hang out with my friends and outside of the studio, we're not dancers who are drilling all day on how to be perfect, you know? Yeah. And as much as I love what happens in the studio, it is my life. Like that's what my life is. I have another life outside of that, that is the balance that keeps me, you know, almost sane not like i would go crazy if it was ballet all the time but like it there needs to be a separation <laughs> absolutely and this is balance i mean this is what we're referring to when it comes to balance leaving ballet at the studio for you allows you to make time and energy to focus on other aspects of life so that it's not because it let's let's face it it's very easy for ballet to become our life because you literally oh, yeah. are in the studio for majority of your day. Exactly. It's totally, it's totally understandable for that to happen. So it's almost like you have to, I was speaking to another dancer about this a couple weeks ago, very proactively integrate that balance where for you, you're saying like, I have to leave dance at the, at the studio. I can't bring it home. Maybe obviously quarantine was a different situation, yeah. but like, Most I can't. <laughs> right. I can't bring this home on a on a day to day basis because I need to incorporate other aspects of life. Socialization, huge one. Maybe even socializing with non dancers. Another yes. important 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 part of it. Yeah. Did the, the definitely mm -hmm. socialization with non dancers. <laughs> my I met my three best friends through a dance summer course years ago. Mm. And, you know, we're all on different paths now. Some of us are still dancing. Some of us aren't dancing. But, you know, now that everyone has their own life and their own path, just having a conversation with them because our lives are all so different now is so fulfilling because it's not just the environment that I'm immersed in every day. It's so important to see the other lives that people are leading because we get so sucked into our schedule which is good it's great to have a schedule and a great mm -hmm. to have you know consistency but seeing like the tracks and the wavelengths that other people are on is just so refreshing sometimes like to and not just have that consistent every day yeah and it, it makes you multi-dimensional you're not just a one-dimensional dancer that's boring that's boring to bring to the stage <laughs> one thing i was going to say earlier because you reminded me of it is this idea of striving for perfection something that i struggled with back in my dancing days until i realized and learned that perfection doesn't exist and if we think yeah. about it if we're striving for this one perfection and definition of perfection to an extent it's boring right yeah. because where's the depth where where's the variation in in this art that we're uh you know performing and so forth so i think that's just a really important perspective for dancers to consider most definitely yeah perfection is definitely unobtainable it is <laughs> yeah when i learned that there my idols my dance idols were out there having their own things that they disliked about yeah. the way they gave a performance i was like what are you talking about that was perfect yeah. like what yeah. could you ever say was wrong about that but it's like it's not it can never be perfect because there's always something we can work on it's just something that you have to accept it's a constant work 
Absolutely. Olivia, question for you. Was there ever a point in your training thus far where you started to connect the dots between how you were fueling your body and how you were able to perform in the studio and on stage? Yes, I think most definitely. When, well, a thing about me, when I was in fifth grade, I decided that I was going to be a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. um, I had recently gotten chickens and I oh, had cute. never made the connection that, you know, what was in my backyard was what I ate for dinner. And it's different for everyone. Some, some people, they have no issue with that and everyone to their own. I have this conversation with people all the time. I can't change the way you feel your body because what works for me doesn't work for you. So I definitely have had a lot of different experiences trying to work out what's best for me to eat on a big day of rehearsals or not a big day of rehearsals and growing up um, food and how we nourish ourselves was a big topic in my household. We were very, mm -hmm. very health driven, very much so that food it foremost is fuel and that you are supposed to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's taboo. Like when you're a dancer dancing for eight hours a day, it's absolutely vital that you eat as much as you're hungry <laughs> for me at least. And I know everyone's different, but I can't get through the day unless I eat when I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. So snacks in between are super important for me. I will be tired, groggy, you know, my muscles just don't work as well. If I'm not constantly making sure that I have things to eat, things to fuel myself, and, pl and it does take planning, it's effort, but it, it's so worth it in the long run. <laughs> it's yeah. so worth it. Yeah, so a couple quick things I wanna um, emphasize here. You being a vegetarian, I get this question all the time. Like, is it okay for a dancer to be a vegetarian? The reason why I get this question is because I'm not a vegetarian. So I think a lot of dancers will be like, oh, she's a dietitian, she's not a vegetarian. Like, should yeah. I be a vegetarian? And I'm like, I 100%, if that is something that is works for you and is important to you exactly 100% vegetarianism even veganism I completely support these yeah. lifestyles it's when it's when it comes from an intention of let's just say like weight loss for example yeah. that's that's when I'm like okay well we need to reassess why are you yeah. choosing these lifestyles is it because you want to follow a restrictive right. regimen right or is it because you're choosing sustainability like you said right. um animal welfare right. huge huge understandable reason to want to follow those types of lifestyles so I, I always want to clarify that and then the other thing that you mentioned uh just having this like feeling based approach for how you utilize food in regards right. to your fuel and you utilizing your body as, as a feedback system in regards to how is my energy in class am i feeling sluggish if so, then I need to prioritize snacks and snacking. So many dancers will fear, they fear calories, they fear snacks. And it's so important to understand that these, uh, as part of a meal plan, are, are what's going to help their performance. And yeah. then additionally, then the last point you mentioned that I wanna emphasize is, again, planning ahead. Because dancers are so busy, because they're active, it's so easy for them to just unintentionally under eat yeah. throughout the day. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I have done that so many yeah. times just cause I'm busy and I'm like, wait, yeah. I haven't eaten for five hours. Right. And it's not an, it's not intentional. It's not because no. you're intentionally restricting. It's genuinely because you're either just not feeling your hunger cues cause you're busy and you're active or your schedule is just crazy and you're not necessarily thinking about food. So ha planning ahead and having, I call it that proactive approach is just, is essential and you as a pre-professional dance trainee I think is a perfect example of how dancers really need to implement that in their training yeah no I definitely the way we're treated here at PNB is like we're part of the company mm -hmm. so it's really like training me for company life and if I've realized anything it's that these really long days I can't be like oh no I forgot a snack. I guess I'll just go without it. Like, I can't, I can't do that for myself. Like, even if it's just, I'm running out of the house and I grab trail mix and a bar for yeah. like my hour break, like that will do so much more for me 
than just being like, oh no, I guess I forgot something. Like planning, and it's been hard for me because I, I am most of the time am very in the moment, present person. I'm like, sure. okay, I'm, what's happening right now? I tend to not plan out my day, but I've had to learn how to do that because I'll get there and I'll be like, man, I did it again. Like, and now I'm tired and I can feel myself like, my energy level going down it's like you said like people count calories and they make it about what you're actually eating but for me i've been lucky enough to have a healthy relationship with food and not worry about that so much and just base it off how i feel because my body is my instrument and if i don't feel good i can't perform the best that i know i can so it's definitely very important <laughs> to have what you need throughout the day. Yeah, and this is exactly where we integrate performance nutrition. So like that more specific planning in regards to what your snacks are, are you incorporating the various macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, variety and abundance for you as a vegetarian, especially thinking about how you're getting variety and those yeah. um, different forms of nutrient, calcium, vitamin D throughout the day having a very proactive approach with that, then also being able to integrate intuitive eating, you know, feelings-based approach, how you're feeling with your hunger cues, how you're feeling with fullness cues, what foods are satisfying you, what foods you have preferences for, not necessarily only relying on some external calorie count or, or yeah. um, food plan or, you know, like Googled meal plan, for example. For example, it's so important to consider all of these aspects when we are learning how to fuel our bodies. Oh, yeah, I most definitely agree. It's, mm -hmm. you know, they say, you know, like about eating a rainbow. And it's yes. like, not just eat the rainbow, because all of the different things are good for you. But every single thing has different vitamins and minerals and nutrients. And especially if you're following like, a certain like diet just for yourself, whether it's like gluten free or vegetarian or whatever, it becomes like obvious which of you need more. Yep. Because I was sick a few weeks ago and I had like intense cravings for like orange juice, but it's because yeah. I needed the vitamins that were in there to make myself feel better. So it's like the, your body will tell you what you need if you know how to listen to it. So yeah. like if you're craving something and you're like, oh, I can't have that just because I'm craving it. Maybe you need it. Like maybe your yeah. body is telling you that you actually need it. Absolutely. And side note, this is even for, these are any type of cravings. Like if someone is craving a more indulgent type of food, very often it's because they haven't allowed themselves to eat that type of food. They haven't given permission to eat that type of food. So restrictions do drive cravings. Like you said, though, also um, certain medical conditions, being sick can also drive cravings. It's literally your body's communication. So often diet culture will, um, put cravings in a bit of a negative light when in fact we need to have a perspective shift on this because cravings are actually a really awesome way that your body communicates to you and like you said you need to learn how to listen to it and honor it so that you're you can develop trust with your body and start and that's to me that's a sustainable way to fuel yeah no definitely it definitely creates a kind of balance and also kind of like a trust, like you said, mm -hmm. like a trust that, you know, what I choose to eat is what's right. And I don't, like you said, I don't need to restrict, you know, if this is what I want and I know that I, everything in moderation and my overall benefit is like the top tier health I could be in is like great. <laughs> for yeah. me at least if that's what leads me to be the healthiest version of myself then Absolutely. that's what I need and one thing you mentioned earlier that I want to emphasize is that what works for you might not work for the dancer next to yeah. you important for dancers to realize that because you might be bringing in a meal or a snack to a rehearsal and if a dancer is looking at you with that and maybe comparing themselves comparing their food choices to you it's always important to remember that everyone's needs are very different and very individual yes most definitely since i've you know had the opportunity to kind of grow on social media since quarantine i get a lot of you know questions about like 
what do you eat in a day? Like, what can you like make a video on like everything that you ate in a day? And I try to emphasize that exact point, which is that, you know, what I eat may not be what works for you to eat. Like, we are very different and our schedules are different and the way that we live are different and it just may not be right. It's definitely something that a lot of people do subconsciously, just like whatever looks the healthiest, whatever other people are eating is what I should eat. And that's yeah. not necessarily true, like you mentioned. Absolutely. What one person's healthy is might not be what another person's healthy is. And we have to move away from this just uniform, uniform definition of quote unquote healthy, which actually brings me to my final question, Olivia, is how would you define what it means to be the healthy dancer? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I know it is. It's, you know, a healthy dancer, I would say making sure that you're just listening to yourself. I think eating good meals is part of it and making sure that you know what works best for you in terms of snacks and this and that. But then also there's like the mental aspect. And for me, it's really holding on to that sense of self that I know who I am. And that really can help me be confident or play a different role or get if I'm having a really rough day, just letting myself know, I know I could make it through this on a great day, but I'm not having a great day today. And that's okay. And I know we didn't talk about this, but sleep is a huge mm, thing for me. Yeah. I love to sleep. <laughs> if I get less than eight hours, I'm not a very nice person to be around. Mm -hmm. But for me, I would say a huge part of maintaining just a healthy mental and physical like system on a day to day basis is sleep and it pairs with, I think, both eating and dancing in a big way. 100%. Sleep is such a huge thing. It, it impacts our hormones, which then impacts our appetite. So sleep plays a huge role in our abilities, both on the stage and off the stage. And well, Olivia, thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. And I really yes. appreciate the insight you've given us. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. Of course, we'll be in touch. Okay. Okay, great.